magnetic waves have an electric field and a, and a magnetic field perpendicular to it, and they're oscillating just like a wave. So that's at about 100 a million um, occurrences per second. Now, if we go up to the visible light, you're seeing me because of electromagnetic radiation that bounces off my face right now, and you're seeing me in the visible range. Wavelength is about 400 to 700 nanometers or 4,000 to 7,000 angstroms in the old units. And you're seeing me just because of light bouncing off my face. So this is important. Uh, luckily, it's a narrow range because if we could see all that, it would be a mess. You would see my face. You would see the radio stations. It would be awful. So luckily, we only have a narrow band where we can see. That's great. But if we go up a little higher, we have ultraviolet rays you know, from the sun, for example, or sun tanning beds and so on. And, you know, they create sunburns, basically. But they're not visible. If we go higher, now we're really in the invisible range. Now we're into X and gamma rays. And now the frequency has gone up to a million, million, million hertz. I feel like Carl Sagan when I say a million, million, billion, whatever. But that's what it is. This is extremely high frequency waves uh, called X and gamma rays up at this end. So it's, it's at the very far end of the electromagnetic spectrum. When you get to that range of energies, you can begin to tickle atoms. So that's how it works. The higher the frequency, the shorter the wavelength. If the wavelength is small, you can tickle atoms. Wavelength is sort of like the size of your thumb. If you want to tickle an elephant, you're going to have to have a big thumb. If you want to tickle a child, the little thumb will do. So x-rays and gamma rays are little tiny thumbs that can tickle atoms. So an incoming x-ray can liberate an electron that's flying around uh, the nucleus, the atom, and it just kicks that electron out, and the knocked out electron is actually the particle that can lay down the radiation dose. So that's how that works. And there's a qu concept called radiation dose. It's the amount of energy that the electron will deposit in a small piece of tissue. So imagine a small piece of tissue in your body. We call that a voxel. The electron passes through that and deposits some energy in that little piece of tissue. The concentration of the energy, which is delta E divided by delta M, in that little piece of tissue is called the radiation dose. So obviously, the more you deposit in here, uh, the more dose there is, the more potential for radiation damage. In real life, you have, in an exposure, you have a lot of these particles. I'm just showing one, but there'd be a ton of them going through that space. But they only go through a small region and only deposit a little bit at a time. So it's like multiple bank deposits. Like hundreds of thousands of little bank deposits, not one big million dollar deposit. So, the good news is that in radiation physics, we can measure radiation dose. We have devices that measure radiation dose very precisely, some down to a half a percent in terms of their accuracy, traceable to national labs so that the radiation in London, Ontario, measured here would be the same as the radiation measured in Colorado, the same as measured in Saudi Arabia, etc., etc. So there's international standards for this. And the device looks something like this. This is an ion chamber. This one has been placed in a CT scanner. This is a plastic body that mimics real people. You'll look at it and say, well, that's not really good. It doesn't look like real people. But it gives you a pretty good measure of what the dose would be at different regions in the body. And you get measurements like that. And this is another one harder to see, but we recently did some measurements on a cone beam uh, CT scanner used in dentistry. It's a little hard to see, but one end of this has an x-ray tube and the other end has a, um, a detector, and it takes images by scanning your head completely, similar to panoramic views you get at the dentist. And, and that's measured as well with the chamber that we put into the beam that was done fairly recently, less than six months ago, calibrating that machine. So we can measure it, but some of you might be saying, yeah, you measure it in a hunk of plastic, what does that have to do with me? So we get a little fancier, we have plastic people. So these are uh, sliced pieces of rubber and plastic that mimic your tissue and actually have bones inside, real bones. And so this mimics, for example, a head. And then we can remove these slices one at a time. So here's one slice removed. That would be sort of a slice through my nose. You can see the nose up here. And at each of these little white spots, we can place some radiation sensors. So we can measure the dose at every location in this artificial head. So that's one way to estimate what people received during these procedures. So these are called dosimeters, and we can measure that throughout the body. This particular phantom we have, um, or a representative of a body, 
actually has the, the bottom half as well, got the whole torso as well, so we can measure in different parts of the body. So the good news is that we can measure dose very precisely. So um, there's another concept, which is if you receive radiation dose, but only to a part of the body, not the whole body, then you have to take that into account. That's less damaging than having a whole body exposure, which would be the case, for example, in a nuclear blast. So we take that into account in a concept called, sorry, called the effective dose. And the effective dose takes into account that only a portion of the body is exposed. And I won't bore you with the math and the equations, but it's a weighted sum of the doses in different parts of the body. And the parts that get no dose, well, you get no contribution from that. Now, this is a nice chart that was produced when the Fukushima, Fukushima uh, reactor went down. And it was to reassure the Japanese people about the levels of radiation dose. Now, I'm not going to go through every number, but I do want to show you a couple of important numbers. So radiation in daily life. Um, here's an important number maybe to carry away in, in your mind. Background radiation, on average, every year, you receive 2.4 millisieverts of radiation per year. So you don't need to, need to worry about the units. Just remember the 2.4. So every year, just by sitting here right now, you're being bombarded by cosmic rays. There might even be radiation from the soil coming up towards you. You can't escape that. You have to live with that. We live with that. So 2.4 is kind of your, your baseline. Now let's go to something else. If we look at a CT scan here, that's somewhere in this range, and that's about 7 millisieverts per scan. So that's about three times background radiation that you get in one shot when you have a CT scan. If we go down to smaller and smaller values, a chest x-ray now is really very little radiation. It's 0.05 millisieverts, so much, much less than background radiation. So if someone would like to do a chest x-ray, uh, and, and you refuse because you don't want the radiation, you have to bear in mind that you're going to be getting a lot more of that in a year. You may want to trade that off the risk and the benefit of not having or having a procedure. So those are the, the landmarks here. 0.05 millisievert for chest x-ray, 7 millisievert on the high side for a CT scan because it's a full three-dimensional scan, and 2.4 for background radiation. So let's go through a few more numbers so that you can situate risk when you consider different exposures. Let's start at the top. So I mentioned the 2.4, that's your background. If you go through an airport security scan, it adds a tiny, tiny, tiny amount. Far less than the radiation you receive because you're in flight at higher altitude and getting more cosmic radiation. So for example, that would add a transatlantic flight when you go to, I heard you're gonna do a, an armchair trip to Turkey or something. It went, going to Turkey, one way, will cost you about 0.05 millisievert of radiation exposure. The flight crew, on the other hand, they're up there frequently. The typical average value for a pilot or a steward is about 5 millisieverts per year. So they add about 5 to their 2.4 baseline. That's the risk that they take. That's the job they have. It pays well, and that's part of the risk. Now, let's get to medical diagnosis, which is the focus of our talk today. Dental x-rays, I mentioned earlier, are quite, quite low. Chest x-rays on this order, 0.05. Mammography, 0.4, a little bit higher. CT scans and GI barium series, they're on the high side, 7 to 8. And cardiac fluoroscopy is very hard to estimate because it depends so much on, on the physician doing it and how long they keep their foot on the gas. If any of you have had these procedures, it's fluoroscopy. They're doing a movie. They're threading catheters. And if they keep the foot on the gas more uh, or less, then this number will change. But it's at the high end. This is a, a high-risk procedure. It's a highly helpful procedure. And there's a higher risk associated with it, so 10 millisieverts. The atomic bomb survivors, just to get the scope, that's at about 2,000 millisieverts. A lethal dose is about 4,000 millisieverts. So if I were to expose, let's say I was a nasty person, brought in a radiation source here, and exposed all of you, whole body, including you at the back, to about 4,000 millisieverts, if we checked about a week to a month from now and asked you all to come back, only half of you would come back. The rest would have died. So that's a high number. The radiotherapy effective dose, if you look at it, is on the same order as a lethal dose. 
you're going to say, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. How could you be treating patients and you're killing half of them with radiation? Well, we're not because the dose is far more localized. It's concentrated on the tumor. It spills out to the normal tissues to a certain extent, but most of it is at the tumor, extremely high doses, and that's why uh, individuals survive the radiation treatment. Otherwise, there'd be no hope, right? So, let me recapitulate. One millisievert, you shouldn't worry about it. 10 millisievert, well, a little bit of a concern a diagnostic procedure, CT scans, GI, barium series, cardiac fluoroscopy. 100 millisievert, oh, now you really start to scratch your head. Mm, I don't like that number. And 1,000 millisieverts, you run, right? You're in a room, somebody says you're going to get 1,000 millisieverts, you're up, you're up, just go. A little bit more. Now, this, again, there are a lot of numbers here, and I don't want to go into too much detail. I'm just going to look at uh, a couple of numbers here. So. These now, I've converted the numbers so that they, they kind of make sense in terms of the amount of time of background radiation. So a chest x-ray is like one week of background radiation. A mammography scan is about two months of background radiation. The barium uh, series is more like three years of background radiation. Again, CT on the same order. And cardiofluoroscopy can, can be a little bit more than that, and it depends on the physician. And then if you convert that to added risks, there are ways to convert that to the risk of causing a tumor by the radiation. And I won't bore you with the numbers. They're all extremely low. Why do I say they're low? The risk this year of any of us developing cancer from natural causes is about 0.25% per year. There's about uh, 11 million, 12 million in Ontario population and about 50 or 60,000 cancers that occur per year, the diagnosis. So that's about a quarter, and then half of those would die from cancer in a given year. So that's 0.25%. So these numbers are far less than the natural rate of cancer induction. So again, there are, there are procedures that are necessary to balance the risk and the benefit. So how does the DNA get hurt? How does the body get hurt by radiation? Uh, well, the radiation basically hits DNA. It also splits up water and produces chemical radicals. So there's the hit that takes place. Here's DNA. Here's an electron going through that can break these bonds, the sugar phosphate backbone of DNA. In addition, there are chemical radicals that are produced in water, and these highly reactive species can diffuse and go and attack the DNA. So there's two ways the radiation can cause these damages to the DNA. And, and then if the DNA is damaged, it can then transform into chromosome aberrations. And you've all seen Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. You see what happens if there's too many of those. Uh, a little bit more, here's the DNA. So here's where the breaks would have taken place, but they will materialize, if you scale things up to the chromosome level, they would materialize into a break in a chromosome. I like to call it a chromosome arm or leg. Uh, if, if it's broken at the nano level, it will re-manifest itself at the the higher scale as a break in the chromosomes. And here's examples of, of uh, chromosomes for individuals exposed to radiation. And I don't remember where I plucked this slide. It's from Dr. Moisienko, who's now at the University of California, San Diego. I think these are samples that were taken from the Chernobyl survivors, because Moisienko was uh, actually from the Ukraine. It's not a good time to be talking about the Ukraine, but he is from there and was assisting with the survivors of that disaster. Anyway, you can see in those individuals, you can see some of these chromosome aberrations, little pieces of DNA. The, the, the chromosomes can be colored through technique. Uh, and if they're broken or reconnected in strange ways, like here, this is called the dicentric chromosome, then you can see it, you can see fragments and so on in individuals that have been exposed to radiation. So that's how it manifests itself. Luckily, DNA repairs itself. Right now, your DNA is being broken at a certain rate and is being repaired at a certain rate. And if the breaks are repaired, you have equilibrium, life goes on. So here are some DNA mechanics that are like car mechanics, and they're here to repair this DNA. And the, and the caption says, you're lucky nobody was injured, your base pairs are out of alignment, and that has your reading frames all messed up. So that has to do with the DNA. And to prove to you that DNA does repair, this is data from our lab at the cancer center. These were cells that were exposed. 
And we put them in an electric field. And when you do that, the DNA gets spread out. It smears out. If the DNA has many fragments in it, we get a comet tail. So it's like a comet with a tail on it. The more fragments there are, the more are contained in the tail. If we wait a certain amount of time before we look at the cells, you can actually see the tail shrinking. And eventually, it's almost back to normal again. So these time frames on the order of 10 minutes are sufficient for single strand breaks on the DNA to repair, which is remarkable right before your very eyes. It's happening right now. Double strand breaks are a little harder to repair. So the time frame goes up to hours usually, a couple of hours to, to repair half of the, the chromosome breaks. But they are repaired. So DNA is naturally damaged. And these are some shocking numbers. Uh, a thousand to a, a million molecular DNA lesions per cell per day. So your DNA is being broken all the time. We think of it as sort of an intact, static. It's not. It's being broken and remodeled every day. If it's remodeled and, re and repackaged and fixed properly every day, there's nothing to worry about. So it's the unrepaired or misrepaired DNA that we have to worry about, especially in critical genes that are called oncogenes. And these are the ones that can lead down the stream 10 years, 15 years from now uh, to tumor formation. So cancer, this is my view, and I think a lot of people support it, is the perfect storm of accumulated DNA damage. So what you eat, what you inhale, radiation, all of that, break your DNA, the DNA is repaired, but there's certain magical combinations, if they occur, they then cause a cell to turn into uh, a cancerous cell. It takes time though, usually decades, it's not an instant, it's not like if you were exposed to radiation tomorrow morning you have cancer, it doesn't work that way. It's usually decades, because you have to accumulate all these other lesions in the right combination in the perfect storm. So, what do we know about the risks? This is a complicated story. There are two kinds of risk. So you get exposed to radiation, you ionize the, uh, the chemicals, etc., and you start to cause alterations in the cell metabolism. We're going to talk about low-dose effects because diagnostic procedures are really low-dose effects. I'm not going to talk about the high-dose effects. Those are the ones that come from a massive radiation accident. Fukushima, Chernobyl, those kinds of accidents. They're rare, they're not likely to happen to us, we hope. So I won't talk about them. These are called uh, deterministic effects because you can guarantee an effect. If someone receives a large, large dose, you can guarantee that the kidney will be damaged or the brain will be damaged. I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about low dose exposures that are used uh, in diagnostic medicine and can break some of the DNA and contribute long term to a potential cancer. But again, reassuring you that a slow and low risk. So, where do we get the data from? How do we know that? How can we say what the risk is? Well, we get it from Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Those unfortunate events of World War II provide the most reliable information on the risks due to radiation. There's a lifespan study following 120,000 survivors that are being followed to this day. This allows an estimate of cancer incidence and mortality in that population compared to a comparable population that was further away from the blasts. So there's sort of a, a control of same age and same type of individuals that did not receive radiation compared to the ones closer to the blast. And you can do that as a function of dose. The closer they were, the higher the dose. So you can map this out. There's also individuals who were at the time pregnant. So you have exposure of the baby inside the mother. They're being followed as well to see if there's any signs of mental retardation, etc. And then there's the children of exposed individuals. So all of these are being studied to this day. There's hundreds of thousands still in this, in this follow-up. And what came out of it is really remarkable. So if the dose, forget the word colon here. Let's say the dose, uh, this is far away from the blast. There are many, many subjects there. There's certain cancers that occur, but a lot of them are natural cancers that would have happened anyway. It would be the same rate, for example, as our population. The ones that received more dose are in this uh, section here. There's not as many because many were killed. But the survivors are there. And if you look at their rates and the number of cancers and you correct for the background rate of cancer, only a few hundred extra cancers. I say only, I don't mean it in a small way. Several hundred, maybe a thousand cancers were caused by the radiation in the survivors. Immediate causes were you know, 
hundreds of thousands of individuals died on, on the spot because of high doses. But those who received the lower doses, the number of excess cancers is thankfully relatively small. And from these numbers, we can predict what is the risk of having a lifetime cancer when exposed to a certain amount of radiation. And here's the number. It's 5% per sievert of effective dose, or converting everything to per millisievert, it's 0.005% per millisievert of exposure. So if you have a diagnostic procedure and the radiologist says, I'm going to expose you to one millisievert, you've added 0.005% chance of developing a cancer in the rest of your life. Compare that again to the 0.25%, which is your base risk right now without exposure to radiation. So how is radiation used in medicine? Uh, ultrasound, I mentioned before, ideal for looking at babies and, and pregnant mother because there's no radiation. Radiography and CT scans, it's a shadow kind of technique. And magnetic resonance, if I had more time, I'd give you my other lecture, which is how to understand MRI using a guitar. I actually bring in a guitar into the lecture room <laughs> some other day. Anyway, that's an interesting one. Uh, but it's, music is the analogy for magnetic resonance. You can imagine resonance and you know, guitar strings and so on. Some other day. Um, CT is actually 3D x-ray vision. The body is essentially sampled in slices, just like a loaf of bread. And the individual slices are shown in this axial view, which is a slice this way, or side views, or frontal views, this way. So it's a three-dimensional picture of the body. It's 3D x-rays. Superman's dream. He always wanted to have x-ray vision. We have it. It's called a CT scan. Tomos means uh, slice in Greek. And without getting into too much detail, the radiation source is up here. The x-rays come down. There's a big detector. And this rotates around you during the procedure. And we get all these rays. And by knowing all of those ray measurements, we can infer what must have been in that slice. And I saw somebody earlier, I think it was you, solving a puzzle. This is the same thing. If you have a puzzle called Kakuro, it's a little different from yours, Sudoku. Uh, if you know the sum of numbers in every direction, that's like having all the rays go through that slice. You can then start guessing what numbers should be in here to be consistent with all those rays. That's how a CT scanner works. It's solving that puzzle. Well, with a lot more elements, usually 512 by 512 little squares per slice. But it does that in seconds. It's amazing. Anyway, and CT measures tissue densities. So it actually can map out how dense different parts of the body are, like bones, lung, etc. And this is a map of some studying that we did where we mapped out electron density in people uh, as a function of these CT numbers that come out of a scanner. And then just for fun one day, Dr. Ian Cunningham at the Robarts and myself decided, we'll see, let's just see how good our CT scanner is. I wonder if it could image a martini. <laughs> we didn't have the martini after. My nose is growing. Uh, here we go. So here's a, a, you know, a traditional glass. There's the, uh, the liquid in the glass, and there's the ice. It's a little bit different in density, right? A few percent. CT scanner, no problem picking that off. Here's the CT scan of the martini. You can see the glass. You can see the olive. You can see the inside of the olive, and you can see the toothpick. This image made its way to the Ontario Science Center. It was on display there for a number of years. I never saw it personally, but they grabbed that. They liked that. You can do a cardiac CT scan now in five heartbeats, get the entire uh, image of the heart. This is not a cartoon. This is a real patient heart. You can see the blood vessels. It's just amazing the detail you can get on a CT scan now. Now, there's concern with CT scans. In 1980, medical exposures only accounted for 15% of all the exposures that we received. It went up. It shot up to about 50% in 2006. So there was a big push to reduce the dose diagnosis. So it has to be a delicate balance. And this has been implemented. It's called Image Gently. This is mainly for children. But there's also Image Wisely, which applies to you, for more senior members of the community. And so every radiology department now tries to adhere to guidelines that the right radiation dose, the minimum amount of radiation dose is used for the individual. Less in children, a little bit more in seniors. Because if you're age 70, and there's a chance that we'll induce a cancer 30 years from now, I don't know if you want to worry about it that much, <laughs> right? 
So here we are, radiation therapy now. This is ultra high doses and we aim at the tumor and we try to miss everything else. Uh, and I've mentioned that before. And the biggest advance in radiotherapy right now at the cancer center has been a, a significant reduction, reduction in the side effects. They're still there, but they're nowhere near what they were even 10, 15 years ago um, when, when I joined the, the department. And that's because the radiation now can be confined to a much smaller, tight volume. So, a little bit of bragging here. Bragging rights for London, Ontario. October 27, 1951, Ivan Smith, this gentleman, and uh, Roy Arrington, this gentleman from Ottawa, from a company called Atomic Energy of Canada, developed the first cobalt, so-called bomb. First cobalt treatment in the world took place in London at that time. And that has saved I'm estimating about 50 million lives worldwide since that time, maybe 100 million, somewhere in that range. It's hard to say a lot of machines were built in Russia and distributed in that part of the world, and it's hard to count those. But it's in the tens of millions minimum of lives saved through this technology. It's been replaced now by linear accelerators, but same principles apply. This is a machine, tomotherapy. We received serial number two of this machine. It was invented by one of my previous graduate students. I'm really proud of him. Uh, and this was an interesting machine. We still have it at the cancer center. It's a CT scanner and at the same time a treatment machine. So the patient is put on the table here. A CT scan is taken the day of treatment and then all the beams can be realigned for whatever the anatomy is of that day. Because treatments go over three weeks, four weeks, things change. This allows you to catch those changes and to adjust treatment every day. The way it works is there's a linear accelerator that spins around there's a detector here for imaging, and at the same time, there's this little very fancy machine called the collimator that throws in little fingers of tungsten in and out as the beam rotates, and that allows you to confine the dose to the tumor and miss most other critical organs. I'll show you a demonstration of that now. If this movie runs, we should be in good shape. So on the left, hopefully, you're going to see the radiation beams aiming at a prostate tumor that's localized here. I picked the prostate because I see a lot of you within that age group, and I include myself. Um, so this is quite a common procedure. So the prostate is here. It's nestled between the bladder above and the rectum below. So we have to aim in between those two. We don't want to overdose the bladder and certainly don't want to overdose the rectum because that leads to other problems. But here are the beams firing as a function of time. And on the right, you see the dose building up. I'll do it again, building up preferentially to the prostate. So this time, forget the beams on the left, but look at how the dose is accumulating here. So you can see as the beams are coming in, the dose is being painted and overlapping more on the prostate here and less on the rectum here and less on the bladder above. And you're going to say, wait a minute, why do you have this horseshoe shape? Well, it's almost impossible to carve it exactly. So there's a bit of spillage out to this region here. But this is the high dose region, the red. The green is far less dose. So that's an example of tomotherapy. And the latest development we have is that that technology of image and treat has been adopted now on the other machines that we have at the cancer center. Another eight machines also have a CT scanner built into them now. Before that, everything was done with three radiographs for alignment. Now you can do three-dimensional alignment using these technologies. So I like to call that the point, focus, and shoot method um, of radiotherapy. And that's what a modern machine looks like. You have the usual treatment uh, beams, and then you have an extra device, uh, which is this one, that also takes uh, CT scans as this rotates around. So you can align everything in three dimensions on a daily basis. So the precision of radiotherapy is shot up. And some of these images are quite interesting. We can look at how patients change over time. This is an interesting picture. It's a little bright. I don't know if we can dim the lights easily. Josh, can you dim the lights at the front? There we go. Much better. Thank you. Ah, OK. So here's, again, the CT scan. You see the, the heads of femur here. Some of you probably have a few artificial ones of these. Those are, those are the parts that are replaced in the hip replacement right there. I call them the ball joints. Maybe I shouldn't. I'm not a physician, by the way, right? So the ball joints are here. And then you can see daily what the rectum does. 
So these are all sorts of contours that we've taken on the rectum over a three-week period. And you can see the rectum changes. Obviously, there's different amounts of gas there, different amounts of food, stool, and so on. So that changes every day, so you have to track that. The bladder can be empty or full. So you can see that's the average size of the bladder, the light blue. And all these other blues are the kinds of bladder fillings that can occur over a three-week period. So you really have to monitor things, monitor things on a daily basis. If you're going to hit the tumor, that's the red one that bobs up and down. Even when you cough, the prostate can bob up and down. So tracking it is quite important. I'm going to show you an image here that is uh, a movie that's a, a walk through the body from front to back. So here we go. And these were done with CT scans. So here we go. We're flying through the body from the front of the body to the back. And we end up at the end with the buttocks. <laughs> As, uh, what was that guy's name? The, the, the movie that starts with the feather at the beginning. Forrest Gump, the buttocks. He got shot in the buttocks. Anyway, so here it is again. You go through the, through the different regions. The bones appear and so on. So I just play that to show you that we have the full three-dimensional picture of the inside of the body with these technologies. And then by doing this um, on a daily basis, you go from this kind of alignment on the left where we were doing our best with radiographs. You can see the high dose region bobbing up and down. And on the right, you can see that things are considerably more precise. We, we keep the red fairly aligned to the target. The beams move around a little bit, but the target's being hit more consistently by using these technologies. Okay, so here's the summary. Uncontrolled radiation obviously can be harmful. There have been accidents, nuclear accidents, there, there's been war, there's been poisonings. These things happen. They're uncontrolled radiation and they are harmful. Highly controlled radiation is used in medicine all the time for diagnosis and for therapy. High doses to small regions in therapy. Combining imaging with treatment leads to better tumor uh, hits with far fewer side effects. And London has very strong expertise, medical and scientific. On the imaging side, the Robarts, fantastic imaging developments. The Lawson Health Research Institute, fantastic imaging developments. Uh, and the Cancer Center has state-of-the-art radiotherapy equipment. So it's a good place to be. I'll uh, open it up to some questions now, see if I can uh, address any concerns that you might have. Okay.